Hey, this is David Ellison here. Frank Bello. We are from, obviously, Megadeth and Anthrax, also Altitudes and Attitude, and we want to introduce our new coffee from Ellison Coffee Company, our signature roast, Altitudes and Attitude, a fine Indonesian light espresso roast. Pick it up, ellisoncoffeeco.com. Very well said. Oh, wait a second, we forgot something. A proud sponsor of the Metal Voice. <laughs> exactly what he said. <laughs> Welcome to The Metal Voice today on the show, the one, the only, Mr. Dave Evans. I guess ex-ACDC, uh-huh. rabbit, solo artist, whatever you want to call him, uh, Mr. Dave Evans, who's been in rock and roll for a very, very long time. How you doing, man? I'm going great, Jimmy, and thanks for having me on your show. Yeah, very exciting, you know. Today, I want to set the record straight in regards to ACDC, which I'm sure you've spoken about many, many times. Talk about your upcoming tours uh, upcoming tour and you know any music that you're planning to put out there in the near future is that okay sure yeah that's, that's fine yeah okay. yeah so i know you just told me uh beforehand you know there's a lot of uh canadian dates coming up i do have yeah uh, i have montreal on april 25th i have toronto on uh, april 26th i have uh rayu noranda which is in quebec may the 2nd yeah. and you're also telling me that the agent's going to be booking some more Canadian dates, and we'll see those official dates come up pretty soon. Yeah, I know I'm back in London as well. That, that's uh, that's on as well. There's about eight dates that have been confirmed so far. So, and there could be a, a couple of other ones as well. But uh, it's looking really great. I think the last time I toured there, uh, I think I had about I don't know five dates or something like that, five or six dates. But there's more dates this time around. So, uh, really, really great. I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. I'll, I'll be doing. I'll be touring with the uh, band Thunderstruck there uh, yep. uh, from, from Canada. They're a good bunch of guys. I've worked with them before, um, so we're all very excited. And it's been a few years since I've been to Canada. I had a great time last time, yep. and um, uh, I really, really love Canada. Um, tell me, what is the set yeah. list going to look like? Um, yeah, look, the, um, the set list is going to be a, a mixture. Really, um, it's going to be a, a mixture. I'll be doing some. Early ACDC songs, of course, because the fans want to hear those um, songs that I did uh, with the band, uh, plus a couple of classic uh, Bon Scott tracks. Uh, but I'll be doing also um, my own uh, material, my own uh, badass rock, as, as we call it, yeah. uh, as well. So you're going to get the old rock uh, from ACDC. You're going to get the brand new uh, rock uh uh, from from my own albums and also one or two classic rock songs as well uh, So it's gonna be a, a bit of a mixture. So uh, it's, it's, the, it's the, the show I do all over the world and uh, it's, a, it's a cracker show and it, it uh, Really kicks ass as we say and uh, people love it. So yeah, it's gonna be great Jimmy K here metal voice look at this the metal voice shirts are now on sale Just go to the video description to find out on how you can purchase one so with the exception of like the first album, you know, like, or let's say they call it the first two albums by ACDC, what other Bon Scott songs are you doing? Well, I'm going to do the classic ones that people really love, like uh, TNT, um, Hollow to Hell, uh, Let There Be Rock, uh, the, the real kick kick songs, you know, so I'll, I'll do those uh, for the crowd. Uh, and of course, early songs that I used to do with the band, like uh, Can I Sit Next to You Girl, Rocker in the Parlor, uh, Rock and Roll Singer, the they're the songs that I used to do with the band originally. I put up a post and I say, oh, I'm going to talk to Dave Evans or maybe I should talk to Dave Evans. And a lot of people say, here's the big myth. You know, Dave Evans, he's been on one song of ACDC, that's it. But I mean, there's a lot more in the history of ACDC that you that you sort of were part of that people don't know. Yeah. I just want to kind of cover that. Let's debunk yeah. the well, myths. Well, I actually recorded quite a few songs for the first album. Uh, before when Bon then Bon Scott joined and he re-recorded songs that I already made popular but before, with the band. Like, but before we go yeah. there, tell me how you yeah. first got in contact with uh, Malcolm and uh, and the boys back then. Yeah, I've, I've been with a band in Sydney uh, called Velvet Underground. The Australian Velvet Underground was a top uh, uh, band here in Sydney, uh, although they hadn't uh, recorded really. Um, and they used to talk about the former guitarist that was with the band, Malcolm Young. Um, so I knew of Malcolm, the younger brother of the famous George Young, you know, from the Easy Beat. Sure, yeah. And, uh, and we broke up. Uh, they, they joined uh, a guy called Ted Murray, who was a 
good mm-hmm. friend of ours. He was a you know had quite a lot of number one hit records. Um, so I answered an ad in the uh, Sydney Mor- Morning Herald uh, for a singer, you know, rock singer that was into like free, which we were all into. Um, also the Rolling Stones, Chuck Berry, that kind of thing. And um, it was Malcolm was on the other end of the line, and, and uh, when he found out it was me, Dave Evans, he knew about me uh, because he you know, kept in touch with the boys from Velvet Underground. Um, we both knew we liked the same music. We'd been in the same band, you know, for different times. Um, so he said he's got two other guys he's jamming with. Um, the famous Colin Burgess, who had been with the Masters Apprentices, he's already been a big rock star in the 60s um, and, a, and a friend of his. So I went around to Newtown uh, in a suburb of Sydney and met Malcolm for the first time, And uh, although I'd heard about him. Uh, so met Mal- uh, so I met, met uh, Colin Burgess, which was amazing because I used to buy the Masters Apprentices records when I was at school. So it was really exciting to meet Colin Burgess and Larry Van Crete as well. So we jammed. You know all the stuff that we that we liked, and um, it sounded great. And uh, Malcolm said he was happy. If, if the other boys were, they said yes. Yeah. So we formed a band. Didn't have a name. And uh, about a week later, Malcolm asked if his younger brother uh, Angus, who had a band called Kentucky, uh, Kentucky had broken up, whether he could audition for us uh, as well. So we said, yeah, fine. Um, uh, Angus came along and auditioned. We just jammed the same same stuff. And uh, yep, we all shook hands, and so the band was then five of us. Um, so that's how the band uh, got together. How old were you at the time? Uh, I think I was 21. I think Malcolm was ni- 19 or something like that. We were all pretty young. Colin was older than us, as I say, because he'd been uh, a big star in the 60s. Uh, I think he was about 25 or something, 24, 25. How old was Angus? He must have been like 15? No, he was 19. Well, oh, Angus was 19 at the time. Okay. Yeah, that's right. And and Malcolm was 20. And oh, we put okay, his age okay. down. We, we put his age down to 16 because he was so little, and um, and also because we were, we were together about three months. We'd recorded our first records. Uh, we had four four songs recorded already. Uh, Soul Stripper, a rock and roll singer. Uh, can I sit next, Can I sit next to you, girl? And Rocker in the Parlor. And um, older brother George Young wanted us to look different. Uh, to the other bands in Australia, because we would like jeans and T-shirt, virtually, virtually what they look like now. And um, he wanted us to look British, and um, so he, so they said that Angus was going to wear a little boy's outfit, a uh, schoolboy outfit, and uh, put his age down to 16 uh, for the kids, you know, uh, to relate to the. We did a lot of school gigs at the time, and. Um, so that's how that happened. So yeah, so he was nineteen. But yeah, 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 that. Yeah. myth number one, like everybody thought, in the, at least in the music magazines when I was young, growing up, reading about this. You oh, know, I still do. Yeah, debunk myth number one, which is you know everybody thought he was fifteen, <laughs> sixteen years old. I mean, I thought that's how old he was. And no, the, the, the schoolboy uniform was actually made for him by his, by his uh, sister, so it wasn't actually a real school uniform. It was one that was made up out of velvet, you know. Um, and but at this point, there was no name, right? There was no name called ACDC, no, not, right? No name at the time. And uh, we got out the name because we, we were, had a gig coming up real quick. Um, uh, we just got informed by the manager at the time that we had a, a show coming up at the famous Checkers nightclub uh, in Sydney there. And um, we better we you know we better get a name for ourselves. Um, and so we kicked around a few names each and nobody could really agree on each other's names, you know. So we said, okay, next rehearsal, uh, we're going to just put three names in a hat each, and uh, whatever name came out, that was going to be the band. We went, okay, that's what we'll do. Anyway, the next rehearsal, uh, Malcolm uh, asked the rest of us, he said, look, his sister-in-law, Sandra, that was George's wife, the older brother, George Young, yeah. uh, suggest- suggested a name, uh, ACDC, uh, which was like alternate current, direct current, yeah. means power. And, and all that sort of stuff, and um, and and I thought it was great straight away because it was so easy to remember ACDC, and it was on the side of all the uh, different appliances. I, I had a portable record player which had ACDC on the side of it, you know, and uh, and I thought it was it was great uh, publicity and advertising all over the place. Straight away, I, I liked it straight away and said, yeah, yeah, I really think it's great. And then Colin Bird just popped up straight away and said, yeah, yeah, he likes it. And Larry said, yeah, he likes it too. So they said, well, shall we call ourselves that? We, we all went, yeah, okay. So we shook hands and uh, we became ACDC right there and then because of that. So I'm going to stop you right there. So 
at the formation of a band, any band, when the, the name is first sort of, you know, uh, considered, you were there, right? You were there at the, the birth of the name and the birth of the band. So, so that's that, right. We, that, we, we were the band. You know, that's, that's right. It. There's, there's no ACDC without us. We're, so we're the, the, the you're founders, the, yeah. one of the founding members, we should say, then. That's another myth, right? Like you are one of the founding members of ACDC. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And let's talk about jamming and working on songs before going into the recording studio, because I'm assuming the song Rock and Roll Singer, Soul Stripper, Sunset Strip, which is called Show Business, right, later on, Rockin' in yeah. the Parlor, which was a B-side to Can I Sit Next to You, these yeah. songs were worked on in a jam session. How did you guys come up with these songs? And and were there any well, other songs? Yeah, there were. There was a, a song called Fell in Love, which I wrote, uh, which Bon Scott rewrote the lyrics of. Uh, I think it became Love Song for Gene or something like that. But we already made that popular with a called Fell in Love. Um, yeah. And also Sunset Strip, which I used to do with the band. Was, I wrote it. Uh, it's a rock and roller. Uh, bon Scott changed it to show business. So, uh, But when I went in to record Can I Sit Next to You Girl and Rockin' in the Parlor, I'd never heard those songs before. Um I had no clue what they were about. Um, we hadn't played them. Uh, Rock and Roll Singer was a song that Malcolm wrote and, and Soul Stripper, he wrote that song too. Um, but uh, And I hadn't heard any of those songs until we recorded them. So when I went into the studio for the very first time, they said, here's the song, Can I Sit Next to You, Girl? Um, and the other musicians hadn't heard it either. So we, we virtually put the song down in the studio from scratch. And uh, they just sang the, the melody to me, gave me the lyrics. I just went out there and sang it for the very first time. And same with uh, Rock and Roll Singer and Soul Stripper and those songs. And the other musicians too, the drummer, they hadn't heard the, so you, the song before. But, but Rock and Roll Singer, are the lyrics about you? Yeah, that's right. Because Malcolm knew that I left home when I was 16. I had a big fight with my dad because I had long hair, all that kind of stuff. My dad wanted me to be a banker and all that kind of stuff. And... Uh, so that's the, the lyrics of that, that song. And, and that's uh, another, actually, that's another mink myth we could debunk because at the time when I was growing up listening to ACDC, I always thought Rock and Roll Singer was about Bon Scott. No, no, Bon, we, I was already re singing that song uh, when Bon Scott used to come and watch us and, you know, he used to hang around with us when we were in Adelaide and yeah. uh, he, saw, he saw me with Angus on my shoulders, all that sort of stuff, so he copied that and um, heard the songs you know, rock and roll singer, we were doing them at that time. Rock and roll singer and uh, soul stripper and Christ next year. We were already, already doing those in the set when Bond used to hang around us. What songs did you have your hand in in writing or lyrics or music or arrangements or melody? Were there any songs? Yeah, that's a, yeah, that's it. The song called Fell in Love, uh, which I wrote the, the lyrics and the melody to, uh, which Bond Scott changed the, the lyrics and called it Love Song for Gene or something like that. And also Sunset Strip, which I only recorded, by the way, uh, uh, just over a year ago. I actually uh, did a recording of Sunset Strip. Uh, but Sunset Strip was a song that I wrote the lyrics of and the melody, and Bon Scott uh, changed that to uh, show business. So there's two songs that I wrote with the band that we were doing live and, and we're about to record. So. so what about the jam sessions? Were there any other ideas being tossed around at the time that sort of appeared later on? <laughs> you know, I don't know, maybe on Highway to Hell or some other albums on Dirty Deeds or any other, you know, you know, you think back and you go, man, wait a second. That was kind of like my idea back then. Um, well, no, because those are the two songs that I, that we sort of jammed with the two songs I, I mentioned that I wrote with them, but Malcolm would just come up with the song um, when we were to record it. Um, another one I, I, I recorded too, Little Lover. Um, oh, yes. And I'd never heard that song either until I got into the studio. Uh, but once we recorded them, we did them in the set before they were released. So once they were recorded, we, we added them to the set. So I was doing uh, Soul Stripper and Rock and Roll Singer and Little Lover with the band before they were released because we were doing the album at the time. And uh, But then Bon Scott re-recorded them. So Where's all these songs? Like, I mean, I, I, haven't well, even, I mean, where are these tracks that you sang on? Who owns them? Is it ACDC, uh, the estate that owns these? Well, it would be... Um, probably the publishing company and that kind of thing. And of course, you've got to remember the, the record label paid for all the recordings. Um, we didn't pay for the for the recording time or anything like that. So uh, Albert's uh, would have them. Um, whether they kept them or not, I don't know. But um, they may be somewhere in the vault somewhere. But uh, they were popular songs. I made them popular with the band. Uh, Baby Please Don't Go was a showstopper for us at the time. 
Yeah. That's when I got Angus, Angus on my shoulders during that song, Baby Please Don't Go. Um, I've re-recorded that myself since, you know, because it was one of our big songs. Even though we didn't write the song, it was our, it was the arrangement. Um, so, yeah, we, we were already a very popular band in Australia. Uh, Can I Sit Next to You Girl was a big hit record for us in, in quite a number of the states. It was top five uh, on the hour, every hour on the radio. Um, it was actually named as the best Australian group record of the year um, for 1974. So the band was really hot. Uh, when when Bon Scott joined the band, we were really hot. We were. So where uh, was where was Bond all this time? Like I mean, I've read in the past that he was like the driver of the band. Was that was he the driver? No, no he was nothing like that. He was just a, a friend of George Young's. Actually, um, he used to hang around with us, and um, they made up another myth: a driver of the band. Yeah, if Angus wanted some cigarettes, he might have driven him down to the shop <laughs> to get some <laughs> cigarettes. But if that's a chauffeur, then I've, we've had many many chauffeurs that have driven us around the place. You know. So, no, he was never a chauffeur of the band and he was never a drummer of the band or anything like that. So uh, they're just myths, again. What other myths are out there that, you know... Oh, it, it is another myth that Angus kicked me off the stage one night. I tell you what, if, if you met me and met Angus, I mean, he's, he's half my size, you know. So that's that's that was just a joke that Malcolm said, I think, on a, on a, t, on a TV show or a radio show one time like that. And, and the fans think it, it really happened. I mean... Uh, that's that's funny. My, all my fans just think that's that's hilarious. So, any other myths that you're saying, man? I, I'm tired of hearing that. You know, about <laughs> there must be so many um, more. No, just a lot of things said in jest too. I mean, uh, Malcolm sort of said a couple of funny things in interviews, but he was only saying it in jest. Uh, but a lot of the lot of the fans, you know, uh, thought that he was saying it for real. You know, stuff like that. Because uh, some of the fans get so serious about their idols, they don't realize that it's show business. We're in show business. And um, so many things about you know Ozzy Osbourne are not true either. You know the people believe things about Ozzy, and, you know, uh, and, and other other uh, artists as well. And um, I remember uh, Liberace, the, the the famous uh, piano player and singer, mm -hmm. uh, years ago, when so, uh, uh, a reporter asked him if he'd heard about all the rumours about him, and he said. Well, I should have heard them. He said, I started most yeah. of them myself. <laughs> and that, it's show business, but the fans believe all this. And, of course, when it's written down in a book, some 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 author who doesn't know the truth you know, just wants to make what a about few the dollars myth? out of it. What about the myth that Angus Young yeah. had? He got a school outfit, you know, like that famous school outfit that he has because he was late for school one day for rehearsal. Well, he wasn't going to school. He was. He had a job. You know, like he, had, he, had, he was working at a, at a printing factory or something at the time, and um, he had a band, Kentucky. I told you, I was, and and that outfit is is not a real schoolboy outfit. It was one that was made up for him by his sister. She bought some, you know, some uh, material, uh, velvet material. It was actually, and and just sat there with a sewing machine and just made up a uniform for him. So it's not even a real uniform. So, so he wasn't late from myth. school, right? He wasn't no, late. He wasn't going rehearsal. to school. No, no, no. It's, it's, it's showbiz. It's, it's all fake. You know. what, but the what, fans lap, lap it up and believe it. So. What were your thoughts when you first heard Angus Young played lead guitar? Um, yeah, he was, he, was a, he was quite good. Uh, Malcolm was a better guitarist because he was older. And uh, Malcolm was a very, very good guitarist. And... Uh, uh, when we first played, they would both play lead. In fact, on Rockin' in the Parlor, Malcolm Young's playing the lead in that song. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we were on tour one time, and um, Malcolm announced to me that uh, he wasn't going to play lead anymore, that he wanted Angus to play lead because Angus had the schoolboy uniform thing and it was a gimmick. And um, and I remember saying to Malcolm, I said, you know, why? You know, I told him myself, I said, you're a great guitar player. I really enjoy your playing. You know, why, why would you do that? He said, no, no. He said, I'm just going to stick on the rhythm because he was very good on the rhythm. He was better on the rhythm than Angus was. You know what I mean? He had that brah on the, with the Gretsch. So he said he's going to just do that. And, and from then on, Angus is going to do all the lead, uh, which is what they've done ever since, you know, um, which was a pity for me because I really enjoyed Malcolm's playing. So, so you built, you helped build that sort of initial groundswell of a fan, a fan base, right? Yeah, of course. We were very, very popular. Uh, uh, I was very popular too, obviously, and um, the uh, the whole band was fantastic. We had we had a few different lineup changes too. By the time I split from the band, uh, Colin Burgess and the, and the original bass player Larry Van Creek was only there about three months uh, before uh, they were replaced. And then we had 
Neil Smith and uh, Noel Taylor uh, on the rhythm section, and they were there for a few months, and and they were gone. And then we got uh, Rob Bailey and Peter Clack uh, to play uh, bass and drums. And it's funny because in the film clip, can I sit next to you, girl? You'll see Rob Bailey on bass and Peter Clack on drums in the film clip, but they didn't play on the record. Yeah. Uh, uh, Colin Burgess, the original drummer, played on, on the on the record. But by the time the record came out and we were going to do a film clip, they weren't with us anymore. So Rob Bailey and Peter Clack were lucky to be in the film clip, but they didn't play on the record. So that's uh, that happened. I mean, you were in a band, let's say about a year. But I know, I, but from yeah. you know, historically speaking, people who've been in bands like one year, two years, three years, a lot of stuff happens in a year. A lot of uh, music man. recorded, right? Yeah, and that year was incredible. We went through three managers in that time as well. So it was an incredible time. Uh, it was jam-packed. It all happened like a whirlwind. Uh, it was incredible. Um, overnight, we were one of the top bands in the country. We played the Sydney Opera House, famous Sydney Opera House, uh, all the big gigs, the Horn Pavilion, uh, uh, Festival Hall. We, we did the biggest shows. We toured with Lou Reed from America to sold-out crowds. I mean, there's... I've still got all the press clippings here. They're all sold out. The massive uh, concerts we did with uh, Lou Reed. The band was was red hot. When Bon Scott joined the band, we were already red hot. We already, already had a hit record, so Bon Bon knew that. He he uh, he, he was very lucky uh, do, do, to get do, the to do, get the. Do you think now you part ways with the band? I mean, which which I find like, I, I, would you regret it? Do you say like, man, I should have stuck it out or? What happened? Well, no, not really. The thing was, I already had, had a big punch up with the manager, right? Because we, we believed he was ripping us off because we had no money whatsoever. We were playing the biggest shows in Australia with a hit record out, and we were sometimes doing two, sometimes three shows a day, lunchtime, early and late, and we had no money whatsoever. And uh, we were all really pissed off about that. Um, the manager, he was doing all right. He got his hair permed. He was flying from Adelaide to Sydney and got himself new jeans and a new briefcase. He was doing fine. We were starving. You know, we were at uh, Whippy's hamburger bar starving. So we all put our money together on the table and we just split it into five and we bought whatever we could to eat, you know. And we were uh, already, as I said, we were on TV and all that sort of stuff. So we were pissed off with what was happening and uh, we had a night off in Adelaide and we all had a few drinks and um, it was brought up with him. The manager was there and uh, he smart-mouthed me and I just jumped across the room and got stuck into him and... Uh, that was pulled apart pretty quickly, so nobody really got hurt. And um, so I split that night from the band. I went, that's it. Because I, I said, I've got to get money. Because I had a flat back in Sydney. They had to be paid the rent. I had a car I was paying off. And here, here I was, a rock star with no money. I was going to lose my flat, lose my car. You know? So anyway, the next day we all sobered up and realized that um, we had all these big shows to do in Adelaide. We had to go over to Perth where the record was top ten over there. And uh, so we, we agreed to stay together for till at least the end of the tour. But things were uh, not good. The manager and I were not speaking, of course. And um, that was when they they uh, went and, and had a jam with Bon Scott because the manager obviously wanted to replace me after that anyway. Um, so that's when they had a jam with Bon and um, they, they decided that Bon was going to join. And we had a big meeting after the end of the tour and that was the end of that. I was out because I said, unless I get paid something per week, I'm not doing this anymore. Are you friends with Bon? Oh, I wasn't unfriendly with him. He was a funny little guy, you know, and um, nice enough fellow. There was um, no hassle between me and him. Um, he was just uh, a guy from the 60s, you know what I mean? He was a lot older than us. He was he was 29 at the time, which was, was ancient when you're 21, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I hear you. Yeah, but... Um, so and we were all friendly together, but he was like a 60s guy and he was a, like a hippie sort of bloke, you know, at that time. But he used to see me with Angus on my shoulders and I'm a, I was a rock star, you know. Um, did, was so, he waiting in the wing? Like, do you think he was waiting, I want to join this band? Yeah, uh, well, obviously, he went, once he, he got the uh, inkling that they were looking for a new singer, naturally he wanted to jump on board because we were a top band. You know, we were, we were in the the top five record, we were on TV, you know, that kind of stuff. Bon was washed up at the time. You know, he, had, he was in a bank of fraternity. Fraternity had broken up, really. So, you know, he was 29, you know, like that's, you know, so he got a chance and he did a great job too. I mean, you've got to remember, he, I love he's a, yeah. 
actor. He's a he's a he's an actor because his first band was in fraternity. No, sorry, in um, uh, what was it? The Valentines. Yes. And uh, they were a, a pop band. He, he used to wear his little page boy haircut and, and satin clothes, and he was a pop guy. You know, he did that well. Then when the hippie era came in, he joined fraternity, and they used to wear, you know, jeans and and, and like overalls and wear a beard, play a flute, you know. He did the whole hippie thing, you know, and he did it really well. They, they had a hit record, I think, Fraternity. Uh, then when he joined ACDC, we were a rock band. So that's when Bon, you know, took the shirt off and did the rock thing. So he was an actor that could play different roles. So he was very good at, at uh, as I say, this is show business is what we're, we're in, you know. And um, so he knew what, he, what was required. And he did a really good job and wrote some great songs. Yeah. Um, now, yeah. Long Way to the Top is still one of my favorite rock songs of all time, you know. Yeah, me too. Um, so, so he got the chance and he, he took it with both hands. But unfortunately for Bon, uh, the lifestyle, the rock and roll lifestyle isn't easy, and especially when you become an international uh, star. You know, I've, that's what I do. I'm an international rock star. And uh, you've got to be disciplined. You've got to cut out the booze and the drugs and shit like that. Otherwise, like so many other uh, international rock stars who are dead now, Hendrix, and you name them, you know, um, and he became a victim of all that too. And uh, it was so sad uh, when he died uh, because he was abandoned, as we all know, uh, in a car uh, in the middle of winter in London there, and uh, a terrible way to go for somebody who was a rock star, you know. Um, you know, when Brian Johnson, you know, was sort of, you know, I guess retired in a sense, I wouldn't say completely retired, but he retired from the live shows, I had yeah, a few. Yeah. I, I had a few singers in mind that I would have loved ACDC, and you're one of them. Like because there's sort of a legacy, and there's sort of, yeah. uh, and you can do the Bond, and, and a lot of people don't know this, but you can do the Bond era very well. You've got a great voice, yeah. and, and I would have right. loved to see that. Did you ever have, have any talks? When's the last time you spoke with ACDC? Anyone in the band? Gosh, well, a long time. But I'm, I'm very uh, close friends with uh, Ross Young, Matt Malcolm's uh, son. Yeah. And um, I used to hang out together when I was in Sydney, in Australia. Yeah. And uh, he used to talk to his dad about me. And uh, and Malcolm, as he said, my dad always said, I've got a lot of respect for Dave Evans, and uh, which is really nice to hear that uh, from Ross. And um, and I'd say, Look, tell your dad, you know, say hi, say hey from me, and stuff like that. Because Malcolm at the time was not well either. Um, this is before he got really sick, you know. Mm -hmm. He was not doing too well, so we sort of got I kept in touch through through Ross that way, and it was as it was nice for for Malcolm to uh, say those kind words about me, and um, and uh, you know, I, as I said to Ross, you know, to tell his dad too that I've always had respect for Malcolm, which I still do. Um, so that was a, that was a nice conduit between Malcolm and myself with uh, with Ross. Yeah, very cool. You know, uh, again, uh, you know, I'll emphasize that I think you should have been chosen to uh, sort of fill in Brian Johnson's uh, role. Uh, not, yeah, you know, instead of Axel Rose. I love Axel well, Rose, don't get me wrong. But I yeah. just think I well, love the continuity of you being there, you know, and, and it was just would have been great. Uh, I know a lot of the fans would have loved that too. But the thing is, what well, would have been great, you know, if, if I'd got a chance to, to get up there with the boys again, it'd be nice to get Colin Burgess up too, you know, the original drummer. You know, he's... He's, he's still playing drums, uh, Colin, and he's still a good drummer. Or, or um, at least for a few songs, right? It doesn't that's mean what I mean. Just, just, just for a few songs, it'd yeah, be fantastic. Because yeah, uh, Colin was there at the beginning. Without Colin, there's no ACDC either, you know? Yeah, yeah. So you're playing these shows in Montreal. You're playing these shows in Canada. What do you want to tell the fans, you know, uh, to get out there? Because uh, I've seen you, you know, on YouTube, play live. I've never seen you in, in concert. But, man, you, your voice is, is still rocking. You sound great. Yeah. Um, yeah. What do you want to tell everybody in the final, your final words or your closing remarks? Well, I just want everybody to have a great time. I mean, this is rock, you know, and uh, there's not many people writing new rock anymore. And um, so, yeah, you'll get the, the, some of the, the great classics and some of the early ACDC uh, songs, which we all love. Um, but also you'll get new, brand new uh, hard rock uh, from my albums that people love all around the world and a couple of great classics as well. So I don't know when I'll be back in Canada after this time, but um, I know one thing I'm part of, uh, I'm living a history of ACDC as well. So it'd be great to, for the fans to come along. I'll, I'll meet them. And um, it's, it's a show that I do all over the planet and everybody has a fantastic time. And there's just smiles, 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 smiles everywhere. So Celebrating Dave Evans. Yeah. 
and ACDC as well. So it, it's just, and it's rock, man. This is rock music, real rock music. And uh, it's not, it's not uh, phony stuff. It's the real deal. So come along. Let's be part of history. Let's rock together. You know, I, I love my music. I love my fans all over the world. Um, so, yeah, just what a great night. Let's right. rock. April 25th, Montreal. April 26th, Toronto. May 2nd, Rayoun Naranda at Evolusan. Uh, great. Thank you for being a guest on the show today, uh, Dave. Looking forward to seeing you in person in Montreal. Uh, maybe we'll do another vid video interview there. Um, yeah, that's pretty yeah, much it. Jimmy, that's yeah, Jimmy, that'd be great. We can do that for sure. And uh, so nice to be on your show. And uh, just the fans that love ACDs, that love rock in general, just come along and let's just have a great time.